gentlemen, to the HCC finals here for 2017, as we are in a 1-1 situation between two previous world champions, Fnatic and MVP Black. And in the previous game, we saw MVP Black asserting themselves quite a bit, being able to control the battlefield a whole lot more than game number one, and they were able to do very well in that second game. Yeah, uh, small, I mean, I mean, there was like two things that made me unsure of it. One is uh, mm -hmm. Rich's false start play in the beginning, but like Wolf said, he really rounded out, adapted, played the macro game, and even his flight and gust ins were more judicial, more well-timed, and more precise. The yep. second thing that did uh, worry is Malthiel's effect. Malthiel, Wubi was absolutely crazy. I think it's the best thing that Fnatic had going for them. But everything else looked really good for MVP Black. They reinserted themselves into the grand yeah. finals, and they said again, winning is what we do. Let's find out where we're going to be going for game number three here, as the battleground will be revealed. MVP Black is going to move us to Battlefield of Eternity. I was just about to say, we haven't even been on MVP Black's best maps yet. Mm -hmm. That's what's scary to me for Fnatic. We talk about BOE, Tomb, which Fnatic is good at as well, Dragon Chair, things like that are still going to be available as we move forward. I think Dragon Chair might have actually been banned there, but yeah. the fact that we are just now approaching MVP Black's picks, this is a scary, scary battleground. We already saw what they did in their previous series. They steamrolled through that. We'll probably try and do the same here. Yeah, I think strategically this is uh, Black's best map. and. It's not always about the team fighting. And we talk about how Europe and Fnatic specifically, obviously in this Grand Finals, but as a region as a whole, are so good at macro, so good at using those heroes like Falstad to control the mm. macro aspects, whereas we saw Black just control with Globals team fighting. But this is going to be about the draft, about the objective. All right, currently 1-1 one, one here in this best of five. Fnatic and MVP Black for $500,000 for first place. We'll do battle on Battlefield of Eternity. Still banning the ETC. Want none of that. So, first pick Murd and locked in instantly, taking control of that warrior, which we've seen Tist do phenomenal on so far. Get that in the hands of Fnatic. Safe start, to say the least. Yeah, and this actually does, I think, hurt MVP Black quite a bit to run this style. They must have a different warrior prepared or planned. We've seen a lot of Johanna in this tournament. You, you know, Grubby likes to talk about the really bad win rate of two Johanna. 2-6, 2-6. Uh, in this <laughs> tournament. Uh, but let's see what, uh, what's, what Fnatic wants to run if that warrior becomes appropriate here. But yeah, I mean, Muradin has been the go-to pick, picked in second rotation both times here for MVP Black. And MVP Black hasn't shown a predilection to take a Nubarak when other warriors are unavailable. Now, I even dare say that Fnatic won't let Tist Muradin happen again, absent an ETC on their own side. Just Tist Muradin finds too many weaknesses, so I think, I think that part is over. <laughs> so we'll, one, we'll see if that's true. One thing that we actually saw the other day was a Samuro. Now, historically, I remember watching Fnatic bust this out at mid-season brawl, and everybody was kind of caught off guard. It was something that Wubby kind of started to formulate a plan, a good way to use this. And Grubby talked about how this is his best battleground. It's almost impossible to die in the hands of a skilled player. And Wubby, at the top of that list, it, if he does pick it, it would be towards the latter end. MVP Black also, by the way, has played Samuro on this battleground during their league phase. So that's definitely an option. Uh, I, I'm confident that Wubi could play that hero well if mm -hmm. he wanted to. I don't have scrim data, but uh, that should be a good pick. But we'll see if it comes out later. It's one of the more wild picks yeah. that we can consider. Okay. Rhaegar, Ar okay. So that's actually pretty cool because Arthas counters Samura pretty well. So, you know, it's still possible. Arthas is actually one of the most picked heroes for MVP Black. I believe the last three times that they've played on this battleground, they've picked it. They so like, it's a tr it's a very traditional pick for them on this battleground. They like to play it when they want to run a more defensive style because it allows a very defensive setup against aggressive dive type comps. In this case, I think it's this Arthas pick for Fnatic is more about controlling Greymane specifically. Um, and Greymane can be very dive or you already have the Karazim on the side, so Arthas is strong against both heroes here. So it's a very safe pick for Fnatic. We've seen it picked on this battleground in Korea and Europe alike against compositions that run the Greymane or other heavy melee. Plus, now we have Murden and Arthas, both control Greymane pretty well. And keep in mind, there can be two Greymanes. And it's not that he's pregnant, it's that Abathur could be, you know, coming out here for MVP Black. The I other... 
I'm glad you clarified that. That was my original <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> Mine too. I'm like, all right. Yeah, everyone's thinking it. Might as well say. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Tyrael Apathur would be like a great follow-up to this uh, initial draft so far. This is a very control style for Fnatic to control that. You talked about controlling the potential aggression coming in from Greymane, but it also gives the added protection for a potential Li Ming or Vala if it were on the side of Fnatic. Instead, we've got Li Ming over on the other side. This is incredible race potential here with Greymane and Li Ming. I wonder if we'll be seeing a Vala coming out here from Fnatic. Fnatic is going full tattoo now. Running through their head is what is going to be the last warrior by MVP Black. I just saw your expression. Thanks, Jao. Can't believe it. That's what I'm going for. Uh, MVP Black has one more warrior pick. Fnatic needs to answer which one it's going to be. I, I would things like... Grubby said. I would like... Uh, <laughs> Run through all our heads, Shehal. But I would like to see a potentially a Tyrael pick here for MVP Black. It seems yeah. counterintuitive in a lot of ways because you don't have a strong front line and Tyrael will get burned down very quickly to a lot of potential types of DPS by Fnatic. But I think when you have Ana with incredible sustained healing coming through with Karazim, you just kind of protect and poke the Immortals, something that Black has shown us already against Expert, albeit with a different type of gleaming composition. I think it's a very safe play. Let's see if Fnatic mm -hmm. starts to sniff that out. Oh. Oh. All right, all right. So if Sanctification comes out, Leyline Seal can put a stop to that. Stasis yeah, overrides yeah. invincibility. One of the heroes that it's been a while since MVP Black ran on this battleground, something that has pretty decent frontline control and makes skill shots very easy to hit is a taunt in the form of Garrosh. Garrosh, obviously, if he gets the toss back, it's kind of a counter there with Medivh to make sure because Arthas doesn't have great mobility, Rhaegar doesn't have great mobility in terms of escape once they're on the back line, Murden's kind of the only one there, and you get the added protection and a whole lot more with Shrumpy on that character. I think another po potential pick here is, well, there's the Johanna coming out. Two we six. talked about it from the beginning. 2-6 indeed. I was going to say, you know, it's just, if it's not the Terry, I was thinking maybe a new Brock is still a strong option, uh, even though it's very uncommon to see MVP Black run this hero. You just remove the Rhaegar, remove that healing, remove that Ancestral, burst mm. everyone down to get the reset that's from Li Ming. But yeah, I like this pick. It's very strong against the composition that we're seeing here. Bala specifically, you remove a lot of that damage and you can really win the race with this. You've got so much poke, Greymane, Li Ming, Ana with the, with the Li Ming, Bernano, and you just blind the Bala and remove that damage. I want to ask though as well, in this world where double support meta is very prevalent uh, and Ana has kind of burst onto the scene where she's able to nullify healing in its completion in, in 100% for a certain window, is Medivh a very smart pick because it's still kind of acting like a support, but you're not healing. You're just applying invincibility. Yeah, the, it is smart. The biggest thing about that frontline control that I talked about with Murid and, and Arth is it allows you to absorb a lot of damage because you have that double frontline. Right. Oh, by the way, Li Ming has very telegraphed abilities, and if you're trying to deny that poke style that Li Ming does so well on this, then just shield the target in the front line. It's on a shorter cooldown than her arcane orbs. So you easily have control to just eat all those shots continue to come in, just eat the magic missiles, yeah. and then put the force of will on for the orb. It's, it's a very controlled style here to really take advantage of the Vala. I think I, you can also make the argument, however, though, that if all the protection is spent on that target against the orbs to kind of uh, act like as a linebacker there at the front to try to block that damage, you have the uh, ability to just with longer sustain damage from Greymane break through that. I don't think that Medivh is very strong against that. Sure, it can kind of help against Cocktails, but not really. And uh, that's why I think it's really cool that MVP Black has two types of damage here, both very strong at poking. Are you giving me faces, <laughs> Jay Hal? It was we've got, to, we've got to work on your sports knowledge a little bit. It's time. Game number three. I'm going to cut it here. We're heading over to our commentary team to figure out who is going to take the lead in this best of five grand finals. 11-0. That is MVP Black's league record on Battlefield of Eternity. But on the other side, we've got Schwimpy's Medivh and Dreadnought. That's kind of a throwback to last BlizzCon for Fnatic. Yeah, last BlizzCon was the first time that we were able to see kind of Schwimpy bust out the old Medivh, and he had some of the best performances I feel like I had ever seen on the hero. It has continued throughout all of HGC, and you know it's something that MVP Black has got to be concerned about. Medivh, he breaks the rules of Heroes of the Storm, and Fnatic is very, very effective with him. Well, let's see if Medivh is enough to deal with the terror that MVP Black is on Battlefield of Eternity. We are all tied up as we head into Game 3 of this Grand Final between Fnatic and MVP Black. On the blue side is Breeze on Muradin. We're going to have Quacknix playing the Vala. 
We have Schwimpy on his Medivh. Next up is Wubby on the Arthas. And we're gonna have Rhaegar played by Smexy. Let's hear it for Fnatic! And in the red, Sake playing at Karazim. Reset, looking for resets on Li Ming. Tist playing at Johanna. Kyocha playing Ana, and finally Rich on Grayman. Give a cheer for MVP Block! Now, Gilly, I know I don't mean to bring up bad memories here, but we've all been there. Initial release, Li Ming, the S of Johan. We've got S of Johanna, though, in this version. The synergy between the two, it is the exact same kind of element. As long as the pairing with that Condemn into the max range orb, it is so much AoE damage for the members of Fnatic to deal with. But as we said before, as the NLS desk broke down, that Medivh pick was so very clutch here for the members of Fnatic to stop that initiation, that MVP Black desires so consistently through their gameplay. Yeah, MVP Black want that pull him in, knock him down with the bowling ball, but Johanna can be difficult to engage with. But this is Tist's Johanna. Tist's understanding of what he needs to do and how the team needs to react, and they have both Leeming and Greymane, who will likely be looking for resets if we see a go for the throat, which just seems fitting for Rich playing Greymane. Yeah, it does seem very fitting for him. You know, always want to be able to make sure he gets the kills, makes the flashy plays. One of the most impressive players in the world, making a name for himself since, honestly, he stepped up for a long, long time ago under the name of Oreo Man. But MVP Black, as you brought up before, their track record on Battlefield of Eternity, it feels like I never appreciated the way that this map was supposed to be played until they walked in once the map released and they just had so many consistent sub 10 minute games just dominantly overcoming their opponents here. And Fnatic's got to find a way to be able to stall out this game and make sure it doesn't go into that direction. Because with the composition MVP Black's drafted, if Fnatic is on even footing post-heroics, not even just because teamfight capabilities, I just feel they'll hold on a lot better. But if MVP Black gets aggressive, they start throwing out the punches on the card Z and find resets, resets, I think that this is going to be a very quick game here for Fnatic. Yeah, it does seem like MVP Black have slowed down on Battlefield of Eternity as other teams have sort of figured out how they approach this battleground, which is to get the first Immortal, get a big experience advantage off of that, get some kills, and then get heroic abilities at the exact same time as you get the second Immortal. Your opponents are so far away from heroic abilities that you don't stand a chance. Grease stepping out, diving away from MVP Black. What now Tiss is under fire. This is stuck in Frozen Tempest. Yeah, he's going to have to get an Iron Skin or a heal. Maybe nice Breeze throwing over the Dwarf Toss over the wall, able to hit the Storm Bolt, but nobody able to move in too far. I wanted to say that the fact that this is going to be a trade or was a trade over the first halftime show is a huge win for the members of Fnatic yes. considering that exact same aspect here. But Wubby's in a bit of a bad spot trying to get the peel there. Portal's down if he needs a way out. MVP Black, they retreat. Now recollect as they're going to move into this mortal. Big orb for Risa as he chunked down a lot of the members of Fnatic. But the problem here for Risa is that he's out of mana and doesn't have Astral Presence inside getting power hungry. So this will be a boost of mana to him being able to get the first immortal of the game and get the couple of globes that come with it. And again, this is a, not that healthy of an immortal. This is a big win for Fnatic if they can stall it out to that level, just go even in it. Even if they lose the objective, it just cannot be that 50, 60, 70% shielded immortal that we know MVP Black is so effective of obtaining. But well, here we are. How much damage can we see them get up on the bottom line? Yeah, poke is crucial for Fnatic, which is why that Force of Will came out on Quacknix. He does is running the Hungering Arrow build. So with that Monster Hunter, as long as he can throw out the Hungering Arrows consistently, you'll be able to burn that down. Shielding already gone as Fnatic gets forward. All they're doing with the portal is just creating space for Quacknix to burn down that Immortal freely. So they take minimal damage on the fort. And it's only going to get worse as if they round the 13 talents here, having that essentially almost 100% uptime, only a second downtime between between Portal 1 and Portal 2. It makes it to where MVP Black will always have to second guess their initiations. Talking about an initiation though, Fnatic here questioning if they want to give up this camp for free. Even Arthas making the flank down. A lot of damage there on Swimpy though forces the portal. But the faster rotation was here for MVP Black and they're going to walk away getting this camp. So do they push along with it as we've seen them do before? Trying to make up for the fact that they didn't get the fort completely down with the Immortal going forward along with this Cosmo camp. They're still keeping a lot of members here, but they send Sake back up. 
to make sure that he's still soaking the experience, but does so safely, so he's going to miss out a little bit. If this laning mismatch continues for long enough, this will be a pretty big advantage for the members of MVP Black. Sake on the Karazim has not that good of wave clear, even when he is in end up using his E and putting out as much damage as he can. Still takes like, uh, I mean, 45 minutes, it feels like. It's honestly only about a couple of seconds, but it's a lot slower than that of the Arthas. So the members of MVP need to mix it up. They understand that. Rich is kind of transferring around, making sure that they don't get too much damage for free here onto the front walls. Fnatic starting earlier on getting their Shaman camp with the good Merking heroes they have of Rhaegar and Vola. MVP Black sending a couple up to the top, but it's been sniffed out from Fnatic, and Schwimpy and Wubby will steal that away. You're highlighting the last game, and it comes to life here in game number three. They're just flexing a bit over the members of MVP Black, scaring them off the objective, because that was a flat two versus two, very capable for the members to take it. Not even portal range distance. That was two objectives at once for Fnatic. And it's that level of respect that it, we used to only see out of the Korean regions, where it would be, again, we talked about Noblesse. He just walks up and he's like, this is going to be my camp now, one versus five. But and we see Fnatic here able to bring that against a team as formidable as MVP. Yeah, it's so awesome to see Fnatic using that. Hey, we're the global champions. Respect us. Get out of our camp. And they get the double camp push in top and bottom lane. MVP Black nearly almost lose Rich, but do get their Shaman in the top. But Fnatic, because of the amount of pressure that they've done, have the lead on the Immortal phase, this second phase. Nice sleeper dart thrown out by Kyo, which is going to force Breeze to kind of just, you know, take a little nap there out in a bad spot. Immortal phase is kicked off into the halftime show. Fnatic got a huge advantage over that first half. That was very well done because of the macro pressure they were able to apply. And as I said before, I'll keep saying it when these Immortals are up. That has got to be the game plan for Fnatic. If they can stall that out, play it slow. It's not whether or not they get the Immortal. It's just making sure MVP Black doesn't get a great Immortal. Dread, you can't sleep on Fnatic. Even though MVP Black won the last game, they're still tied in this best of five and anything can happen. Sleep Dart hits Wubby. Gonna follow up with the grenade Look as the reset throws things out. Did you see the timing on that orb? It was the yeah. second Force of Will it drops. He immediately is gonna hit that orb. Just showing the prowess of reset on his legendary Li Ming. It's a one four split for MVP Black. Expect the members of Fnatic to posture up. It looks like they're doing so. Portal late. Two members split, not able to land the Stormbolt though. Tist is the one furthest out. Asake comes up. All of MVP Black are here, ready to jump on top of Fnatic. But excellent howling blast from Wubby to get the disengage for Fnatic. So Rich will be sent back down to the bottom of Mortal. MVP Black still trying to punish the lack of poke, only just having the Vala there as the pick, but the portal's down. And Tist is almost out of mana as well. Fnatic is able to secure the remainder of that Immortal, saving the re rest of his mana to make sure he gets the Iron Skin out. And now Fnatic find themselves with their very own Immortal here in game three. Immortal will go to the top lane. We are neck and neck between the two teams with the experience. Breeze Dwarf tosses in to get in place for Stormbolt. Asake close enough to the towers that he is just fine. Here comes the Immortal for the push. Lots of range poke for the members of MVP Black. So trying to bring down the shielding. And because of the dominant laning of Arthas and again the lack of solo laners. Hold up though, the Stormbolt before the Iron Skin puts enough pressure. Sake tries to go in, throwing out those Fists of Fury to scare off Quacknix here. But I was going to say, without the Greyman, because the laning mismatch, that makes it to where there is so little anti damage to this immortal anti-siege available for MVP Black, only relying on reset, and he's pretty low on mana himself. Yeah, as the analyst has mentioned, Portal. MVP Black are way more focused on all five being together. Portal's there, but Tiz stays strong in the front line, and nobody dares to dive in on the back line of MVP Black, who have finally pushed back Fnatic. Keep in mind, the first team to get a kill in that type of situation, especially if that went over to Fnatic, it would have quick, quickly tipped over to that heroics. Leyline Seal immediately get the follow-up there. MVP understand, though, they are going to get this retreat here, stall it out a little bit longer. And until they manage to secure themselves their own heroics, at this point in time, Fnatic's going to be able to use that kind of bullying we saw before, but, uh, you know, a little bit more understandably so now with this window. Yeah, and Fnatic are going to be able to increase that a lot more once they get the big power spikes of Medivh. They're sitting at 23 stacks for Master's Touch, now 25 as he's gotten a bunch. And once he gets quickening at 13, you talked about it, the portal uptime being so good for the team. 
that's when we can see Fnatic really come online with their aggression. And generally, that's when we see Fnatic come online anyway in the types of compositions that they run. They like to wait until they at least have heroic abilities before they strike. And though we didn't get it into the last game, this is one of the few maps where Syndragosa, I don't want to use the word meta, but she pops up here and there, you know, she likes to freeze down all of the structures. So I like the fact that the members of Fnatic are holding on to that, though. No Haymaker, and sadly, we commit to Army of the Dead, but it's going to enable that team fight. This is where I expect Fnatic to really be a problem for the members of MVP Black, unless we see Rich or Reset just popping off with that backline DPS. No sleep Dart yet. MVP Black has their heroic abilities. We're not seeing Divine Palm. Seven-sided strike chosen by Sake. And of course, a nano boost for Ana for MVP Black. Traditionally, normally, I would say I'm pretty hesitant to support seven-sided strikes. Okay. But this is one of the few cases where I think it is kind of a must for MVP Black. Even if they save somebody with a palm, the long six, the long team fight is not in their favor. They're going to be out sustained. They're all going to be out gap closed. So what they need to do with this raw DPS composition, I know it seems surprising, Gilly, but they just need to flat kill them. And go, they need go. to throw out the DPS, bring the battle to Fnatic. Well, they can't bring the battle now, at least not in the way they would like, because Blessed Shield didn't connect. But that'll be up soon enough. But not for the immediate start as Breeze went forward looking for a Storm Bolt. Yeah, a bit of miscommunication there from the rest of the members. Seven Sided ends up going down. It's just going to deter Fnatic and push them back a smidge longer. Vala separating from the squad. Going to use those brilliant level one through seven taunts to make sure she gets that damage onto the Immortal. Though MVP Black have really good Immortal poke between Greyman and uh, Li Ming, they have been way more focused just on defending, and that has allowed Fnatic to get this free damage on the Immortal. But if they clump in chokeholds like that, that's where I expect Tiss to really get the value out of it because it condemns and get the initiation. And a lot of that situation comes down to the lack of hard CC on a frontliner. When Blessed Shield's off cooldown, the standard Johanna problem, she cannot get the fight that she wants to initiate, especially into an Arthas. You have to pop the Iron Skin just to even keep up with them. Yeah, she at least has conviction. Speaking of that Arthas, this Mubi is moving it forward onto all of MVP Black. So is Breeze jumping in the back. Oh, Lay that ancestral! Out. It ends up landing there for Smex. Force of Will going to be used for Schwimpy and keep him alive. Look at Wubby on to reset. The sleeping dart goes down on top of him. We already see Schwimpy diving on the side. And Sake ends up using seven-sided strike to keep himself alive. This, He's able to make it out. This fight is on all fronts, but Tiss barely staying alive. Oh. Has the Iron Skin and reset with an orb obliterate. And for the first time, MVP Black now is going to set themselves ahead of Fnatic and get a lot of damage here on to these, this mortal. Luckily for the members of Fnatic, we're at a point in time where death timers are not long enough to secure the remainder of this immortal. They will be able to spawn up, recollect themselves, and be able to force this fight over the next half of the immortal. But that was a brilliant team fight coming out from MVP Black. They were just the focus and being able to split the members of Fnatic and not keep them clump, I would argue, was part of the reason they were successful there. In a full five on five death ball, as Anno said, and I've been trying to save through this game, I do feel like MVP Black will struggle. But if you split them up, focus on small skirmishes, every hero, except for Johanna, is very, very successful in these minor trades and not death ball strategies. Yeah, so much of that came down to using a seven sided strike to allow Saki to stay alive for a long time and then the focus on keeping Reset alive. Wubby in danger, has army of the dead if necessary, but not even going to use it, just gets out uh, in time. He's able to make it out through the portal. Wubby questioning if he wants to move up. Leyline Seal is off cooldown. It's going to be used, only landing on the two. Reset able to get the dodge. Army. Oh. Army dropped. Force of Will as well to keep him up. Stormbolt does end up landing on Johanna, but she's got her iron skin. She's able to make it out. Reset, or excuse me, Rich gets hit by the Howling Blast. And it doesn't look like Fnatic is going to actually fully initiate this fight. No, the poke is just not quite there for MVP Black to get this immortal, but Fnatic are fully focused on just drawing this out as long as they can. They have sent nobody up to even poke the immortal of MVP Black at this point. They're just pushing back MVP Black further and further toward their base. The longer they can solve this out, the more likely that they are going to have the Leyline Seal. Breeze able to hit the Storm Bolt, Dwarf Toss in, but the peel from the Condemn is there. Schwimpy in the back lines, he gets the Ancestral, he's gonna keep himself up, but Breeze is low, there's a Force of Will, two-man Storm Bolt, and then they turn it around, they get the pick on the Breeze, they get oh, the pick on the Wubby, reset. and Reset is popping off! He takes out three members in the blink of an eye, that's what it's all about for MVP Black with the Nano Boost on Reset. He gets so many resets, and now MVP Black finally are rewarded for their efforts with a half-shielded Immortal and 13, a full level ahead of Fnatic. 
MVP Black's damage composition does carry over away from team fighting. It does translate into their siege capabilities. They will have to risk their positioning a bit more, especially into the Arthas of Fnatic. So you know the thought process for them is going to want to be diving past, trying to force the fight once more onto this Immortal. As you see Breeze flanking up above there on that Murden. He wants to see if they overextended that shrub and then get this all-in initiation. I'm just blown away by how Sake has been playing this car. He's so aggressive, trying to make sure that he can give the reset to reset and as well to having to go for the throw in gray main. The portal. The flank from Fnatic. They're all in here trying to get the fight. They're able to take the portal on out, but on the back line we see Quacknix actually dropping down. Reset is getting the resets again. This guy is just unstoppable. Four members of Fnatic are down and MVP Black claimed this keep. They're going to claim this keep and they may step even further forward. No, Mithi for 20 seconds. He'll have Leland Seal when he comes back up, but this is core damage being put on by MVP Black and yet again it's only Breeze here to try to stop what may be the inevitable. 80% and counting. It is not going to be stopped. MVP Black is going to take game number three here and take a lead over your defending world champions. Every game they win, they look a little more confident every single time. This team has been waiting years for this grand finals. And they don't want to let anyone take what they feel is theirs. It is amazing to believe that with even the dominance that we've seen of a team of MVP Black in the past, that they are now one game away from making Heroes of the Storm history by being the second global champion crowned ever, two-time winner. We have never had that in Heroes of the Storm history, and now one game away. By no means is Fnatic out of this, though. We've seen them overcome far bigger opponents, far tougher situations than this, Gilly. Fnatic still has a chance. Let's check back in with the analyst ask and see what they thought of game three. The MVP train in full force now, and it seems going to be very difficult to actually slow that down. Wolf, it's uh, looking powerful here for MVP. I mean, reset, uh, if you give him an inch, he takes a mile. And I, I think that this has been kind of a trend that's continued throughout this tournament. This is not the first time he's had Ana being able to give him those nano boosts in those important team fights. I think that Fnatic is going to have to draft around this. Now, this map in particular is the best map for Li Ming because she has that poke. And even if you've got your linebackers there in the front uh, to block the damage, it doesn't go th it doesn't eventually end up being a win. You can block it for a while, but eventually Black wins that trade. They have two types of damage, and the team fights were incredible there. I think the whole thing about what we've seen from Reset is Li Ming, Li Ming, and guess what? More Li Ming. Mm. So he's done really, really well. It's surprising because Li Ming really fell off in certain metas, and it just seems like Reset's like, it doesn't matter. And again, it goes back to the Eastern Clash number two when we talked to Rich about if you could name who the best player in the world is other than yourself, who would it be? He said, my teammate, Riza. His biggest problem was running out of mana. <laughs> yeah. and, the, and pretty much everyone was dead by that time. So that's kind of OK. Yeah. Uh, we've seen those massive uh, team fights where Reset absolutely popped off. Some of them were too graphic to show again in a replay. Ah, I see. Uh, okay. yeah, so <laughs> but I have two small little moments. I mean, for the most part, you know, we see these big fights. Two small, cool things I actually wanted to teach the Heroes of the Storm community. Quacknix has dropped very low right now. And he's the main damage dealer on the Immortal. So you actually see a cool portal play here, allowing Quacknix to gain some space alone with the Immortal. And you know, this was never meant to do anything except to buy time for Vala. So that was kind of a cool play, just thinking with portals and creating some space because you are forced to respond to it. Fnatic was unable to bring that kind of thing to bigger, more important team fights, but it was a cool thing. And we have another replay there. Um, again, uh, a really good moment there as we go to the next replay. This is uh, a great defense here by MVP Black, and they're really pushing the level 10 advantage here. Or, or uh, rather, I should say, the lack of level 10 advantage mm. by Fnatic. Mm. They recognize this is their moment. You see Karazim is actually gunning right for Vala, and that means that Breeze and... Oh, wrong thing, lol. Uh, that means that Breeze and <laughs> Arthas uh, need to defend. And look at Reset. He has been the biggest threat as we run this replay forward. When an Arcane Orb comes out, look at the instant reaction from Breeze and Wooey. 
and the orb comes out, they walk forward towards it because orbs deal more damage at greater range. They needed to peel for Vala here. So this is definitely something that was part of the strategy here for Fnatic yeah, yeah. Uh, to block those shots as often as possible. But it's during Nana boosted Li Ming, really, that uh, even they could not block. Yeah. Absolutely amazing uh, ancestrals there by Fnatic in the later team fights, but it just wasn't enough. I think a lot of it comes down to that spell damage, and a lot of it comes down to the uh, wave of force that we saw. The wave of force really well placed, just displacing Fnatic's composition, moving Medivh out of shield range, for example. These were the moments that led to those first takedowns that explodes with critical mass. Well, gentlemen, I did get word that the